Good morning, YouTube. Welcome to the Reptile Barn. I've been trying and trying to film this video, and this snake just will not hold still. So I'm just going to film, and I apologize if he's not really in the frame as much as I would like him to be. <clears throat> this, of course, is an eastern indigo snake. Um, this is a young male. We've actually had him for a long time, but uh, he's been at a friend of mine's house for quite a while. So you haven't seen him on the vlog much, if at all. Uh, so I just want to talk about our, our journey with this species. This is Drymarkon cooperi, the eastern indigo snake from the southeastern United States, uh, especially Florida, but there's, a, there's some in, uh, I believe, Georgia and Alabama. Um, this whole genus is awesome, the indigos and crebos. But uh, this has been just one of our all-time favorite animals from the beginning of our reptile journey. So actually when I was in college, at a time in my life that I didn't own any reptiles, I did a research project on these guys and just fell in love with them. I got to know some professors in Georgia who were working uh, with these guys, uh, a little bit uh, of interaction with the Orion Society, which is a non-governmental uh, that works with reptiles mostly in the southern United States. Um, anyways, so I just really, really, really liked them. Um, knew that I would like to work with them. Look at that pretty boy. This guy's name is Llama, by the way. Um, so, when we graduated, I started digging in deeper into the, the you know captive side of things as opposed to just um, you know the wild populations and uh, found breeders working with them got a lot of good information and eventually we bought a pair an unrelated pair and uh, this was maybe six years ago now and you still see George sometimes on the vlog that's our male our original male However, our female, she got an enlarged heart, which is a condition that happens with this species quite a bit. There was kind of a genetic bottleneck where there were hardly any left. And a lot of times when that happens, you get, you know, kind of rare problems become not so rare. Um, regardless, we eventually were able to get another female. We have a little baby. Um, we got this male. And we're getting one more female. So we will have two males and two females uh, as soon as our last female arrives here in a month or two. And that's where we'll keep it. We're not going to have tons and tons of these guys. But they'll be unrelated. So we're going to be able to breed them, have two different lines that are unrelated of Eastern Indigos. And we're just super excited about it. And that's kind of how our entry into this species went. Uh, first colubrid we ever kept, I believe. Yeah, in fact, I'm certain of it. Other than, you know, when I was a little kid and I had a corn snake. So, um, just a little bit about these guys, since I haven't really featured them on the vlog in a while, for any new viewers. This is a very large colubrid. Uh, the longest snake in the United States, actually. Um, I once made the mistake of calling in front of my like herpetology professor saying that they're the longest snake in North America and he chewed me out. He's like, uh, you know Mexico is part of the United of the North American continent, right? You know what lives in Mexico? Uh boa constrictors. <laughs> I was like, ah and he's like, you can't make that kind of mistake. You don't need to just say stuff. Um so anyways, don't make that mistake. They're not the longest snake in North America, but they are the longest snake in the United States. So, uh, they are a very, very generalist predator. They're very close to the top of the food chain. Uh, of course, you know, a, a wolf could eat them, things like that. But uh, they act more like an apex predator than your typical snake does in the wild. Uh, very high confidence. They don't always flee if you see them in the wild. Uh, you'll see them in the middle of the day, bright sun out, just sitting on a rock, perfectly visible. They they kind of know that they are a big bad snake, <laughs> right? Uh, very strong jaws, 
um, really powerful bite, a little bit bigger teeth than you would typically see in a, in a non-venomous colubrid of this size. Um, they're fast, they're powerful, they are really good at eating snakes. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, locals like them because they eat so many rattlesnakes. Um, I'm sure they have some, some level of resistance or immunity to the rattlesnake venom, but uh, they're just really efficient at eating snakes, but they'll eat anything. They'll eat amphibians, birds, rodents. Uh, I have seen images of an indigo uh, ripping hunks off of a carcass, <laughs> like a dead animal. Never seen snakes do that. They, these guys like to eat. Um, however, unlike, say, a lot of the king snakes, they are not uh, crazy, I guess. Um, you know, when, when, when I first open their cage, I'm always very cautious. I'm careful. I don't want them to be like, food, and bite my finger. It would hurt bad. But if I give them just a minute and they realize there's no food, um, they're not like the king snakes that I've known that will just kind of randomly chomp down on stuff just to kind of like see, oh, could this be food? Let me take a look with my mouth. Kablamma! And then all of a sudden there's a king snake chewing on your finger. Um, these guys are not like that. They're really not biters. I've never been bitten by one. Uh, I've never been struck at by one. Even the babies, when I get them as babies, very confident animals for a baby snake. And as they get older, even more confident. Uh, they come in two color phases that are just naturally occurring. There's no morphs. Uh, this kind of jet black color, especially as they age, uh, with just that bluish sheen to them, which is why they're indigos, right? Um, and then some of them also have this red throat, which I just love. He's not going to hold still and show off his beautiful colors for us, but that's okay. Incredible color. I love these snakes. Pretty active, as you can see, <laughs> um, but very friendly, very trusting once you get to know them and they get to know you. Um, they poop a lot, like a lot, a lot. And while George, my big adult male who's, you know, over seven feet long, he only ever poops in his water bowl, which I love because then the rest of the cage stays clean very easily. The rest of my, my other two, they do not do that. <laughs> they poop wherever and they poop frequently. My indigos all will poop within a one to three days after eating like clockwork. They, they never hold back meals like multiple meals before bowel movement like my pythons and boas do. You know, I can feed my, my pythons, my savus, my, my white lips, my ball pythons, my, even my retics that are a little faster moving three or four meals before they'll have a bowel movement. These guys will poop every single time. So it's a little more work to keep them clean. It's also a little more work to keep them fed because they're just a faster metabolism. You can't go two, three weeks between every single meal, even for the adults. Uh, they just, they need food more frequently than that. Now, they don't need gigantor meals like I'm giving to my pythons, you know, relatively speaking. Um, they don't open their jaws as wide. They don't seem to just have quite as elastic of skulls. Um, so I don't give them huge things that they really got to stretch over, but I do feed them very frequently. So, yeah, that is all. I just wanted to show off Llama. I'm not sure has ever actually been on the vlog. Here in a month or two, you're going to meet our last one, and then we will have our, we'll be set for indigos. I'm very excited. It's, you know, we were just devastated when our adult female died. Um, it was crushing. We never bred her, of course, because we knew she had an enlarged heart. We tried everything. You know, we, we were at the vet with her many times talking about, you know, special diets. Maybe if we give her super tiny meals, but more frequent, will that be less strain on her heart? Do we need to keep her a little bit more cool or, or what, what can we do? We tried everything and she lasted another two years or so after we had diagnosed it and then she just passed away. <clears throat> and we did confirm that it was an enlarged heart with a, you know, with a necropsy, but, uh, Anyway, so my little baby female here and then another baby female coming this, this spring. Uh, we'll have to grow up before we can breed these guys, but we don't, we don't really have this species primarily to breed them. We will breed them. Um, I'm excited to do that. 
Um, you know, it's always a thrill to have a species like this that we can breed more of in captivity. Um, I, I, I'm excited about that, but we really keep them as a, as a passion project. We just like to have them, interact with them. Um, we can do more of the like uh, uh, enrichment stuff, almost more like we would do with our monitor lizards. Uh, they just seem to enjoy testing themselves. I'm not sure what it is exactly. I just, I really love their personality. Probably my favorite personality of any snake that I keep. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit of a pain to get them because they are a threatened species. So you need to have a, a permit for interstate commerce. Um, they just want to ensure that you don't have a wild caught snake because every single one in the wild needs to be left in the wild. Uh, we do not want to contribute to their uh, endangerment by harvesting any from the wild whatsoever. So, so they do keep pretty close tabs on ones that are sold in captivity, which I'm fine with, by the way. I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, but uh, once you get the permit, it costs like a hundred bucks. It's not super difficult. Fill out maybe 14 questions and send it in. Um, then you're good to go. And uh, that is all for now. I hope that you guys enjoyed. Um, I really, really just love this species. You will see more of them on the vlog. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, we're the Reptile Barn.